Okay, so we're going to turn the lights off again. I want you to watch this. Someone, I didn't even ask him to do it. They were like, I, I want to help. And so he said, I want to do videos for you. So he did this video, which is pretty awesome. I just want you guys to check it out. Go ahead. It's time that we stop being ugly. I am going to drive a sword deep into your heart. Because I'm telling you, this thing is easy. Our mission statement of the gospel is to become love. So that wherever we walk, people want what we have. We so love the world that we give. What do you give? Everything that you are, you give. You don't hold anything back. Come on, man. You don't have the right to have a bad day. No, well, you don't know what I've been through. Man, you don't know what he went through to give you his life. Man, what is it worth to trade your life? Why would you want to hold on to something that's crushed? What if you were so possessed by God that it didn't matter what people said about you? God has given you dominion by His Spirit that every place the sole of your foot treads, it's yours. God grabbed your heart, not for you to be bound by the fear of man anymore, but for you to be possessed by the love of God. And if God is for you, who cares who's against you? here for you you're here for him you abide in him you flow with him you move with him learn your identity who you are as a son stop being manipulated by lies and dominated by hell just surrender say you know what God I didn't get it now I do God I want this and God says that I can work with that Whoa. and you don't have to say well God what do you want me to do today just do it well, God, where do you want me to go? Just go! Well, God, who should I pray for? Everybody! Persecution's not here, but it's coming! And if you can't rise up now, in the midst of nothing, you'll never be able to stand in the midst of persecution. We're so used to being comfortable. We're so used to just staying inside our comfort zone. Holy Spirit has called the comforter because He knew that you were going to be uncomfortable to step into this thing. Rise up and be the bride. Be a passionate warrior that God created you to be so you can burn with fire and the world can watch you burn. Why would you hide this thing? Why would you be a basket-headed Christian? Why would you put this thing underneath of something that is meant to shine so that your whole house will be lit? It's meant to shine so that your city can be lit by one person. Everywhere you go, you're a conduit for God's grace, for His glory, for His mercy, for His compassion. You're a conduit for His fire to flow through, to touch the world around you. All you've got to do is say, yes, I want this, God. That's it. All you've got to do is say, I'm in. All that's required is that you're sick and tired of not having this happen in your life. And God says, you know what? If you're sick and tired of it, I want to fill you with me. When you're on the earth not to represent you, God, by mercy and grace, mercy woke you up today to give you one more day to manifest Him and not you. Come on, guys. This thing's real. Rise up. Be the bride. Be passionate about something. Give your life. Stop holding on to you. What are we doing? What are we doing with this? Come on, all you got to do is say, I want it. That's it. There's no like, there's no secret except the mystery and it's been revealed. The mystery is Christ in us. The hope of glory. by love that we would destroy hell for a living that guy did amazing <laughs> he did he sent me a thing and he goes 
you know, I've been so touched, I just want to do videos for you. And I go, well, okay. So he sent me that, and I went, oh, God, that's awesome. <laughs> I just, it was just neat, like all kinds of people. So I want to let you guys, this is the first time um, that I got to speak. I've been, like, I took, like, a three-week break, which I normally never do. So you guys are going to get unleashed on. <laughs> oh, my God, I got so much inside of me. I'm like, got to get it out, got to get it out. This is also, um, I, I did, I, did a, I was in a ministry called Neck Ministries. I've been in the ministry for, for six years. And Dan and I both decided that I would start my own ministry. And so this is my first event under the name of Lifestyle Christianity. <laughs> which is really cool. But it's my, so it's a brand new thing. Like, which is awesome. It's the same thing, but it's a brand new thing. Um, and it's really awesome. I'm really excited. So this is my my first time to speak underneath the name of Lifestyle Christianity. So the website's going to be lifestylechristianity.com. If anybody wants to go there, um, it's, there's only a homepage there. It just has events on it right now, but it'll be up and developed. And I'm going to have teachings and all kinds of stuff on there. And videos to help to flip your boat. Because I'm not interested in just getting you to come out in the water. I want to flip it and take it away. So that, <laughs> I'm serious. Because, like, just asking you to come out in the water, you might decide not to. But if I flip it and take it, you don't have a choice. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's important. Because God wants us to live by faith. He doesn't want us to walk by sight and live by sight. And if you live by sight, sometimes you're like, well, I don't know if I should. But if your boat's gone, you have no choice. <laughs> come on. Yeah. Awesome. Um, just uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Just to let you know a, c a couple of things that are on my, on my radar, man. Um, I've gotten involved with these. I went to, who here knows Reinhardt Bunky? <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And Daniel Kalenda is the, the president, the one that he's his successor, the one that he's handed everything to, the reins to. Um, he's the president of CPAN. <coughs> I did my first um, African crusade with those guys, and Daniel, and, and, and it's just crazy. I'm involved with, Pastor bunky has got these schools of evangelism that he started to do. Um, I went to the first one. It was amazing. Bill Johnson helped me to go there. Just awesome. I wasn't an imam. I'm not from Bethel, but their family, and Bill, like, paid for me to go and blessed me, helped me go, and it was just amazing. So I went there, and then after the first school, I got asked to help at the rest of them. So I've done six of these schools of evangelism with Pastor Bunky and other amazing speakers that it's just baffling. So this year I have all kinds of events, schools that I'm doing next year, and then I do a bunch of, we did our first, I did my first fire conference in Slovakia with Daniel, and we spoke to, gosh, 6,000 leaders, and then the nighttime sessions were like 9,000 leaders in Slovakia. Like, that's just crazy. Like, Czech Republic and, and Czechos or Czechoslovakia split. So it's Slovakia. And it was crazy. So this country that was totally wrapped up in the communism bondage thing for years and years and years and years and years. And, years and then the wall went down, I think, in 86, somewhere around then. And so we went there. It was crazy because Daniel's like, no, I, these are very, very conservative. It's a very conservative um, place the pastors are very conservative he goes so you know it, they're not going to be they're not going to be ready for you <laughs> only because they're like suit and tie and he didn't tell me any of that so I go there just me you know and I get there and I'm like dude like what's going on he's like I brought you here so that you could like offend their mind to reveal their hearts <laughs> which was amazing but I, it was so crazy because when I got there, pastors came up to me and said, we've, we've so wanted you to come. And it's in Slovakia, <laughs> and the, which was awesome. And so media can be really good because, like, they've gotten a hold of the media and the media has gotten a hold of them. And just the, the videos and all over the world, like, people are taking the videos and using them and then taking teaching and matching them up and doing the stuff, man, which is incredible. So I'm, I'm so excited about what God's doing. I'm so excited about the hunger that I, that I see here. Um, 
One of the things I was talking to a um, pe- couple people today about is the danger of hero worship. The danger of speaker worship. And, and it, it's, it's not wrong to want to be fed, but it's wrong. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk about some intense stuff today, okay? So, <laughs> just, no, because... Because it needs to be, it needs to be talked about, and and I, I am totally in love with Jesus, and and I'm the first one to get prayer. I get it, but it's dangerous to elevate impartation above relationship. And so, in an age that we we are understanding the impartation, the laying on of hands, and the gift that's on a person's life, and to hunger and thirst for the gifting, it almost, it almost. It does, and and so what happens is over the all over the earth, this thing has been almost elevated to the point where it's o- above and beyond our capacity to want relationship, and and Jesus didn't pay a price so that we could just hunger and thirst after speakers. He paid a price for us to hunger and thirst after righteousness, <coughs> and without righteousness, you'll never understand your right standing with God, and you'll always have condemnation. And you'll always have guilt, you'll always have shame, you'll always have condemnation. And I have been free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. I've never had one day, and I've only been a Christian for nine years. I've never had one day. It's illegal in the kingdom. (laughs) I promise. Did Jesus pay a price for us to just, like, get to heaven? Or did he pay a price for heaven to get into us? So if he paid a price for heaven to get into me, there has to be something that gets out of me. So, it, so the Bible doesn't say deny the devil, pick up your cross, and follow him. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say deny the devil, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. It says deny yourself. So selfishness and righteousness are opposites. And so sometimes, because I'm trying to get prayer from a speaker or because I want somebody to pray over me, I'm seeking that in an unhealthy way. At the cost of truth that could set me free forever. All right. This is huge. See, I, 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 I've grown up in God. I was, I'm just going to share just a bit of my testimony so you knew where I came out of. So you understand because I'm going to share my heart. I don't know what time I got till today. Uh, yeah, I always don't, don't shake your head and say whatever you want, buddy. <laughs> we'll go all day. <coughs> No, I just don't understand. I have three weeks of holding back. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I, I want to share where I came out of so you can understand because there's a lot in what I just said. I mean, I've been free from condemnation since the beginning. I mean, I, I've, I've never had one day, not one, not one day of guilt, shame, or condemnation in the kingdom. Not one day, man, like ever. I've never woken up condemned. I've never went to sleep condemned. I've never had lunch and been condemned. I've never looked in the rearview mirror of my car and been condemned. <laughs> because to me, rearview Christianity is illegal in the kingdom. When I look back and visit things that Jesus says are done, I'm asking a spirit of offense to come into my present tense and bear dead fruit in my life. And what I'm saying is I don't believe the blood was enough. I need something else, and there is nothing else. It's the truth in the cross and the finished work of Jesus Christ. He paid a price. Love paid a price to set me free from me. God, by mercy, woke me up. Mercy woke me up today to give me one more day to manifest him and not myself. But when I manifest myself, it's unhealthy. It's dangerous. And as a matter of fact, I can still manifest and walk in gifting that way, I can, I can walk in gifting, but your gift will make room for you, which is dangerous because you, can, you will gain recognition by your gift and not realize that you're before an audience of one every day. And if you realize that you're before an audience of one every day, it won't be about your gifting. It won't be about you having to impress God. You're already impressive because you believe that what Jesus did is enough, period. So if I stay in the finished work of Christ, I can never go wrong. And if I stay in the reality of the blood of Jesus and the right standing that I have with my Father, you can't hurt me. Look, this almost seems like too good to be true. The gospel is so good because God is truth. 
But it almost seems like there's no way nobody can live that way. I've had pastors come up and rebuke me publicly and tell me there's no way. You're preaching a facade. You're preaching something that's a fantasy. I said, no, it's the gospel. I'm not being mean. I've lived nine years in the kingdom without being offended by one person. It's almost impossible to believe when I say that stuff. People are like, well, gosh, I wish that was me. But it is you. It's, it's who God created you to be. He took it so that you could be free from it. Come on, man. If Jesus was offended, we'd be in trouble. He was hanging on the tree before people that ripped off his flesh, spit on his face, ripped out his beard, spit on him, treated him like trash, and he was holy and beautiful and pure and lovely, hanging on a tree. Imagine Jesus, I'm out of here, forget it, God. You want me to die for them? They don't even appreciate me. There is no way I'm going out like this. I'm out of here. Yet we develop that attitude because we get offended and hurt by people. That's not okay. Come on. I'm here to make pastor's life easier. <laughs> if we see who we are, every time you look in the mirror, you, this isn't a condemnation speech. This is a freedom. This is the freedom of the blood of Jesus. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free. Indeed. So why would bondage come back in where freedom is? Because we lack the understanding of who we really are. It's all about identity. It's all about your identity. See, if I teach you how to pray for the sick, that's one thing. But if I teach you who you are, praying for the sick won't be your focal point. It'll be a byproduct of being a son. If I teach you how to prophesy, you can do it. And you can live in a mere gifting. But I don't want you to ever walk in just a gifting. I, look, if you do walk in gifting, walk in this one. The free gift of of righteousness, the one that Romans says in Romans 5 that we're supposed to reign as a king in this life through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. And the abundance means the violently excessive amount of grace. Man, God's given us a violently excessive amount of grace to walk out the free gift of righteousness. Grace isn't some twisted weird thing that allows me to do whatever I want to do. Grace, Jesus, grace and truth came through Jesus. Jesus didn't want to do just whatever he wanted to do. Jesus did everything that God wanted him to do. And that same grace is on your life for you to be able to walk and live and surrender your being and live selfless and live in righteousness and truth and walk in the reality of what it means to be a son of God as your father or a daughter as God as your father. Then you don't have to look impressive through your gifting. You can be impressive because you believe in Jesus. Man, listen, if I never got to pray for anybody ever again, I would still be okay because I'm right with God. Now, that's not going to happen. But if I didn't, that doesn't mean I'm a failure. And if you live in gifting, you're only as good as your last healing. If you live in gifting, you're only as good as your last prophetic word. And if you're only as good as your last prophetic word, you better give one and you're not good. Then you're in works in gifting. And why would I want to do that? It's the love of God. It's the profuse love of God. The love of God compels me. I don't just walk into gifting because I want to just speak a word over somebody. I'm compelled by the love of God because I want them to know the Father. I want them to know who God is as a father. When God came and fathered me, it didn't matter who fathered me when I grew up. When God came and fathered me, it didn't matter what my mom said about me when, I was, when she was pregnant. When God came and fathered me, it didn't matter that my mom didn't want me when I was born. I'm here because all life comes from God, and God said yes. It doesn't matter if my mom and dad were ready for me. Man, people aren't ready usually for the kids to come. Kids come. They just come. But all life comes from God, but we've made it psychological instead of supernatural. And we've made it about we've got to get this out of you so that you cannot be rejected. There's... It's so weird. Jesus was rejected so that we could be accepted. You can't reject me. I'm not kidding. 
I talk to Muslims and witches and Hindus. They can't reject. You can't reject me. Love never fails. It's impossible. Really. If I go to pray for somebody and they rebuke me, it doesn't mean anything except they don't know who they are. But if I get offended by what they should have known not to say, then I don't know who I am either. Come on, listen to me. Well, you don't understand. I got hurt by the church. Okay. Oh, well, get over it. Come on, dude. I'm so tired of hearing that stuff. You got affected by, because somebody in the church said something or did something that they shouldn't have. So all of a sudden, you carry that with you. Then all of a sudden, you look at people through the wrong lens. And if you say church, you got the memory of what you went through instead of what Jesus went through. He paid a dear price for his girl, for his bride. He died for her. And you don't have the right to look at the church in any way if you're not willing to lay down your life for her. And if you were laying down your life for her, you'd never say something about her. Come on. It's the truth. If I got attitude because somebody should have known better than to hurt me. If I got attitude with them, then that just means that I don't know who I am. So that I should have known better not to be hurt by something they should have known better not to do. What's better? Don't try to take notes. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> just get this CD if they have it. Is this making any sense? Look, I, I travel all over the world. And this is an epidemic. Being offended. Stop it. Jesus was delivered up for our offenses. And he was raised for our justification. It's the one-two punch of God. Boom, he knocked the devil once. He was delivered for our offenses. Then he was raised for our justification. And when I see that, oh, when I see that I've been justified, what does that mean? It's just as if I never ate the tree. Listen, redemption is different. Redemption isn't just being purchased. It would be great if that was it, but it's not just it. Redemption is being brought back to the original value that God created me to be in the beginning as if I never ate the tree. And I stand before God as if I never sinned. That's real grace right there, man. Real grace is that I stand before God righteous in his eyes. Not through self-righteousness, not through my own work so I can justify that. Because that's self-righteousness. But for the works of Jesus, I live in his finished work. So that everything that I do is operated out of a place of being instead of doing. It's not about what I can do for God. It's what I do with God out of my place of being in God. It's awesome. There's no pressure. Really, there's no pressure at all. It's so, like, awesome. I'm, I'm free from me, which makes me free from you. <laughs> Serious. If I'm free from me, I can't be hurt by you. We don't know what they did. Why would we elevate what something did over what Jesus did? Because we got attitude. That just needs to shift and change. We need to look in the mirror and see who God created us to be. Because he created us in his image. And if you look in your Bible and my Bible in 1 John, 2 John, it says what God is. It says God is love. So if God created us in his image, why would I allow something in life to affect what he created me? I'm telling you the truth that it's a lack of identity. Because we're sons and daughters of a king. A king that didn't just like open a car door for us. He died for us. He died. Love gives. Love just gave. He, God so loved the world that he gave. So that whoever would believe. Wow. What does believe mean? Believe means to be absolutely fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. So let me ask you this. Believing in Jesus. Is it just to believe that he paid a price for me to get to heaven? Is it just to believe that he paid a price for me to get to heaven and for heaven to get into me? Or did he pay a price for me to get to heaven, eventually being my destiny, my destination, destroying hell would be my living, but the absence of thinking like hell would be my existence. Look, uh, this is not unattainable. Dude, this is the reality of the gospel. This is the one that you said yes to. Without even knowing the full boat, this is what you said yes to. So the spirit of wisdom and revelation is on the earth to make us think like Jesus. 
it says God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways. And in the Old Testament, it said that. But in the New Testament, it added something. It says his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. It's in Corinthians. His ways are higher than my ways. But we have the mind of Christ. So that doesn't mean that I'm God. That just means that God has embryonically planted in me the reality and the capacity to house and think like Jesus. What does be renewed in the spirit of your mind really mean? What is don't be conformed to the world? Let me just start with that. Romans 12, 2. First, let's hit Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to offer your bodies to God, which is your reasonable service and pleasing service to God. First one, as a living sacrifice. So as a living sacrifice, I say, God, here I am, my whole body, spirit, soul, and body, my everything that I am. First commandment, what is it? Love God with everything I am. So every part of me loves God. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I'm just bringing a couple things together real quick. To offer my body to God as a living sacrifice. Everything. Holy and acceptable and pleasing and is my reasonable service to God. The first commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your might, your life. Pretty much. Right? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God or approve what is and what is not the will of God. The will of God is to not be offended. This solves so much more stuff than you think. People are like, just give me a word. I, I, won't, I don't prophesy in meetings too much because you lose everybody. You prophesy and people are like, give me a word too. Then all of a sudden, like, truth is out the door. Just give me a word. I'm not against prophecy. But there is a foundation, man, that we need to be built in our hearts so that intimacy is the infrastructure and everything that we have. So that you can, man, what would it be like for you to sit at home, open your Bible, and God speak to you? Whew. I live for that, man. I live for that. I'm on a plane. I uh, open my Bible or I listen audio to, to the word or I, I exercise for 45 minutes. I'm, I have the word in my ears. It's constant. I don't ever, I don't, I, I've never let it get away from me. I constantly am in the word. It's everything. Because that word, even though we don't get it when it comes in, it goes in and it makes its home inside of you. And then it produces fruit that you don't even know is there. Then all of a sudden your lips speak something you didn't even know was in there. And then when you, someone cuts you off in traffic, instead of getting an attitude and having a charismatic worship service for the wrong God. <laughs> that's a good, good, good word right there. <laughs> people get upset about people raising their hands, yet they don't mind having a charismatic worship service for the wrong God. So instead of that, all of a sudden this word's in you. Someone, someone rips you off or someone cuts you off and you bless them. And, you, and it's so weird. You didn't have to try to. It was automatic. Someone gives you attitude and you call them a harsh word with a kind one. That's the Bible, man. That people persecute you and you bless them. And you realize that when they do that to you, you're more blessed. So you're blessing out of the place that you're more blessed because you got persecuted. And you're persecuted for righteousness sake. And it's awesome. And you feed on it. And the more it comes, the more it's amazing. I don't live just to get persecuted. But it says if I live godly, it happens. So it's going to happen. It's a promise from the Father. <laughs> we want everyone to be fulfilled by that one, man. It is. All those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. So, so what if somebody snaps at me? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> People get, oh, God, they didn't want to hear it. It doesn't matter. Is it truth? Give it. 
And I'm not talking about condemning people. I'm talking about speaking the truth in love. In love. So if someone cuts me off, I'll just give a perfect example. I have three daughters, 17, 7, and 2. Awesome. All girls, I'm blessed. <laughs> I am. Amazing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got four, right? Four girls. Woo, you're more blessed. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the car beside my daughter. Somebody cuts me off, man. Right in front of me. It happens. It just happens, man. It's life. It happens. It's okay. Get, get in. And then, and then we pull up right beside them. Because we go to the next light. So they look at me like I want to fight them. Because that's what people do. Serious. So my daughter's in the, in the passenger seat. And I have a rage, rageaholic guy that's right beside me. He might be a Christian. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not being mean. I'm, I'm being serious. But in all seriousness, there ought to be a difference between. Because that's being conformed to the world. That's not being transformed. But what good is my transformation if I rage back? So I roll down the window. My daughter's window. <laughs> I do. And I say, hey, what? <laughs> so I just want to tell you, man, that I don't know what I did, but I'm really sorry. And I want to tell you that Jesus loves you so much. You're amazing, bro. <laughs> man, shut the blank up. I said, I would, but I can't. <laughs> I'm not being mean. Serious. And then it goes to this. I mean, I told you to shut up. Listen, man, you have a pain in your right shoulder right now. <laughs> Promise. And Jesus wants to heal you. No matter how angry you are, it doesn't matter. God loves you so much, man. Man, what the blank is wrong with you, man? So if the light's long enough, I can tell him. But regardless, I'm going to pray for him, and Jesus is going to heal him. Because I don't need him to be calm, cool, collective, or in faith for Jesus to touch him. I promise. This is real. And pray for him, and Jesus heals him. Man, what the, what, the, what the blank is wrong with you, man? What'd you do, man? What'd you do? God loves you so much, man. Bless you. I call that a drive-by. But if you allow offense to permeate your heart, you can never have that encounter. <laughs> and he might be a Christian. And, and, and all funniness aside, he might not know Jesus unless he sees it in me. You know, it says that we endure the hardship for the sake of the elect. It says it. It's in Peter. It's so good. I'm... I'm, I'm I didn't open it, but there's a lot of word that's going to come at you because I'm good. But it's what sets me free. It's what enables me to be okay. It's what I've buried in my heart so that I don't sin against God. I live in a place, man, where I, I don't want that stuff in my life, man. There's a new grace doctrine that's out there that says pretty much that anything goes, man. Please don't let it be in your heart. It's important that we become doctrinally sound so that we become so grounded in truth. Don't think that you can read a bunch of books about the book because you can't get relationship with the author. And I'm not against reading books, but if you've got to read a bunch of books about the book, then all of a sudden you're riled on everybody else's revelation and you'll never get your own. And Jesus paid a price for you to have an encounter with the author. The Holy Spirit's my best friend, man. He's, he's everything. And we have to be very careful that we don't elevate stuff above that. We need relationship. We need intimacy. We need to know how much our Father loves us. Because it's the love of God. It says to be filled with the fullness of God. To be filled with everything that God is, it is, is to know the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus. Jesus paid a price 
for God to have fellowship with me so that I can have koinonia, so that I can have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, communion, the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit. So watch this. Listen to this. This is amazing. This is how it works. I'm going to use an example because my wife and I, you know, we're married. If I don't get who I am from God, I will look for my wife to give me something that she can't because only God can give me who I really am. But if my wife doesn't get who she is from God, she will look for me to fill something in her that only God can fill. So if my wife gets who she is from God and I get who I am from God, we give that to each other and we call that communion. Without that, you have problems. Because you'll be looking for a spouse to fill something that they cannot. A spouse can never fill the intimacy that a husband and wife are to enjoy outside of Jesus. Can't happen. Doesn't happen. Only Jesus can bring that real communion covenant bond because God is a God of covenant and marriage is covenant. And it's the truth, man. It really is. That enables me to love my wife with all my heart, my soul, my strength because I'm loving the Christ in her. It's a book on covenant, on marriage. It's beautiful. It's God-given, man. It's blessed by God. It's awesome. It is. If, but if, if, regardless of marriage, no matter who you are, as a daughter, as a son, if you don't get who you are from God and grow in that place, you will always look for somebody else, like a speaker or a book or a CD, or worship music to fill something that only relationship and communion with the Holy Spirit can fill. And you can never worship enough because without communion with Holy Spirit, you can't worship in spirit. And you can't worship in real truth because real truth only comes from Holy Spirit because He is the spirit of truth. He is the one that makes it alive. He is the one that makes it real. He is the one that makes it completely amazing and available for all. He makes it so that your life is no longer ministry. It's a lifestyle. He makes it so that when you're at your job, it's on. When you're in an airplane, it's on. When you're in an elevator locked in a steel doors, people can't get away. It's on. <laughs> Serious, man. He makes it so the place... He makes it to the place where you're not ashamed of this gospel, no matter where you are. It doesn't matter. You won't be ashamed. Why? It says this in Romans 1, 16. It says, for, anybody know who Lecrae is? Yeah. Pretty awesome, right? 116. They got this 116 click. It's all about not being ashamed. He has a shirt that says unashamed. Went to, my daughter has it. It says, Una Shamed, unashamed. So, Okay. <laughs> So Romans 1.16, I always tell her, Una Shamed, it's on her shirt. It says, unashamed, unashamed. It's unashamed of the gospel. It says, it's in Romans, it says, I'm unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. And it says, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. And then it says in Romans 1.17, for in it, in what? In the gospel. What's in the gospel? The power of it. What is the power of the gospel? It says, for in it. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And it says, for it is written, the just shall live by faith. So my faith has to be in the righteousness of God. I have to grow. It says in Matthew, I, I'm not going to be able to share my testimony because it's too much. I was lost, now I'm found. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm on something. I need to hit this. I want to pound this and... I want to drive it home so that it can be the foundation that you live from, okay? Because righteousness is the foundation of everything. It is, it's everything, I promise. It says in Matthew 6, right after the chapter of worry, it talks about worry. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Matthew 6, uh, Matthew 6, 19, it says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. 
what it says. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Yeah, that's what it says. And then it says, do not worry. Therefore, do not worry. Why do you worry about what you will eat or what you will wear or your stuff? That's what it says. Okay, and this is a huge deal because worry is rampant, man. And Jesus paid a price to crush worryism. Worryism. Serious. He paid a price for us to enter into something that we can only enter into through the finished work of Christ because it is the narrow gate. Many are called, but few find it. Many are called, meaning I'm called by God, but few find the place of true rest that's in God. And I've lived in a place of the absence of worry because of the presence of rest for nine years. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, right? Take upon you my yoke. It's easy and my burden is light. Come to me. I will give you rest for your soul. So your soul, you have three parts. You have your spirit, right? Your soul and your body. So Jesus paid a price to give us rest for our soul. Are you with me? Stay with me. I'm all over the place, but it's the same thing, okay? And it'll be all nailed down scripturally. It'll be so sound and perfect. I promise, because Jesus is perfection. He is. Righteousness is everything. The truth about the finished work is everything. And if we don't live from the finished work, our life will be continued. If I don't live from the place of finished, it will be continued. It is finished is a big deal. To be continued is illegal in the gospel. I'm going to say it again. Jesus paid a price for us to live from the finished work. And once it's finished, we're not supposed to look back into it. But when we look back into it, we live in a place of unrest. So when we look forward, we put our hands to the plow, plowing forward, realizing that rearview Christianity is illegal and it drudges up condemnation, guilt, shame, and all the things that we wish we'd never done. That place is regret, and regret produces death, but godly sorrow leadeth unto repentance. Regret means that I wish I never did it. Repentance means I did, but that's who I used to be. Are you with me? This is huge stuff. How many people wish that they'd never look back again? Come on, man. Wouldn't that be awesome? What if you never look back at who you weren't anymore? What if you only look forward to who God says you are and you ran from that point? That's finished work. That's finished work running. Back here, danger zone. That's a valley of dry bones we're not supposed to dig up. That's resurrecting the wrong dead. Come on. I'm I'm only going to share the truth. I don't have any. Look, I go to places sometimes and they, they are, if, if what I'm preaching and what I'm sharing about the finished work challenges your ministry, you ought not be in it. If, if preaching the finished work and living in the finished work challenges the ministry that you have, you ought not have one. Because if it's not about the finished work, it's not Jesus. If the cross, if the finished work and the truth of the blood of Jesus is a challenge to the ministry you've established, you might be in trouble. This is not making sense. I'm not against ministries, but if the blood of Jesus and the truth about the finished work and the reality of what Jesus paid a price for us to be free from challenges the ministry that you've built your foundation on, you might have built on another's foundation. Am I all right? Yes. I promise, man. Dude, the, the, the truth be told is that I'm free. I, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not preaching something so you can believe my doctrine. This is all biblical gospel truth, man. It's all amazing, awesome My conscience has been free and clean for nine years. I have never, ever, 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 not one time in all my Christian life violated my conscience. 
Ever. Because the blood of Jesus paid a price for my conscience to be cleansed from dead works. It is the truth. In Hebrews 9, he talks about it. He talks about the, he talks about the blood. And he talks about the covenant. He talks about the, the temple. He talks about the veil. He talks about the high priest going in to offer up you know, sacrifice for sin. But it says the way into the real tabernacle, the way into the holy of holies, the real one wasn't yet, wasn't yet available because Jesus hadn't come yet. But they went into the one that was set up by man. Right? With the veil. And the high priest only would go in once a year, not without blood, to offer, uh, offer for sacrifice for people's sins committed in ignorance. That's what it says. And the high priest would go in there and offer up blood once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he would give and he would offer up blood. And all of a sudden he would leave there, but his conscience would still be condemned because it was unavailable for the conscience to be clean. So even the high priest in the Old Testament that would go in, the one that would have the bells around the bottom of his of his robe, the rope tied to his foot, he would be the only one to go in, the high priest, once a year, to offer up blood. And if he didn't do everything exactly right, he'd be dead. They'd drag him out. It was all works, it was all performance, and it was all set up by God to show us a, it was a tutor of the one to come. It was all set up to show us our need for a savior. So they would offer up blood and sacrifices was not good enough for the cleansing of the conscience, the blood of bulls and goats and, and animals. And it says, but Jesus came. That's what it says. It says, but Jesus came with, with the sacrifice, not of bulls and goats and the blood of animals or the ashes of the heifer for the sprinkling of the unclean. That's what it says. But with the blood of Jesus, he offered up once for eternal redemption for mankind, one time forever. One time forever. And it says, how much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse our conscience from dead works? How much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse our conscience from dead works in order for us to serve the living God? That's what it says. It says because the, all those sacrifices and everything that was done in the Old Testament wasn't good enough to cleanse the inside. On the Day of Atonement, you'd be washed on the outside for one year, but live in condemnation on a constant basis for the next whole year. And then even when the high priest went in again, you'd be cleansed on the outside, but still on the inside condemned. So it's not okay for the body of Christ to still be condemned when she's entered in to this thing through Jesus Christ. But a lack of her identity and a lack of relationship with the Holy Spirit, a lack of an understanding of the truth of the finished work of Christ... Leaves us with the same condemnation, but moving in gifting, condemned. And he paid a price for us to be free inside here. So when I look in the mirror, I like what I see. I look in the mirror, I love me. That's not arrogant. It's not. Denying yourself. I heard Bill Johnson share it once. He said, denying yourself is simply thinking of yourself first. And I went, that sounds like Bill. I need to hear what's next. He's amazing, dude. Baffles me, man. He said, it's like on the airplane, when the airplane masks drop. It says, first put it on yourself, then put it on your neighbor. Because if you don't do this first, you won't be around for this then. And then all of this, oh my gosh, if I don't have communion with God, I won't be around to do anything. If I don't have a relationship with God, I won't be around. But I can do gifting all day. But if I don't have this, <gasps> I'll burn out. Oh, I was like, oh, as soon as he said that, all the stuff just flooded me. I'm like, this is, this is what God has groomed me for. He's groomed me for this. He's groomed me to stay in intimacy and function that, that gifting would be just a byproduct of my relationship with the king. That it would just be, when I pray for somebody and the sick get healed, it's not because I, I needed to, 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 it's because I'm in love with God. Because he loves me. He's profusely head over heels with me. He's got a picture of me in his wallet. <laughs> yeah. That's not arrogance. That's confidence. God loves me, man. He thinks about me every day. If we would realize it, Jesus paid a price so that you would recognize and realize the gaze of God is on you constantly in your eyes. He never looks away regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you've done. And when you see that, the love of God hits your heart and changes everything. So that you no longer want to do things that mess stuff up. 
All of a sudden, real grace hits you, wraps itself around real truth, and grace empowers you to walk out what truth calls you to. And all of a sudden, you are flooded with this amazing love of God that is profuse, and you feel like if you don't let it out, you'll explode. It's not about, i got to go pray for people. Oh, it's like, oh my gosh, I get to love somebody today. It's different. It's the, it's the reality of the gospel. This is why you're alive, guys. You're alive to bring truth into people's lives, regardless if they want to hear it or not. What I'm preaching right now isn't sought after and appreciated all the time. It's not. And I'm okay with it because I didn't come here to make you happy. I promise I came here to bring the truth, the reality of the gospel. The only one I know. I, 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 honestly, I didn't even come here. I didn't come here to impress you. I came here to empower you. I came here so that you could be free from you. Honestly, I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying that's all I know. So Jesus paid this huge price for my conscience to be clean. For me to not have condemnation, guilt, or shame, or none of that stuff. Let me get back to Matthew 6. It says, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So if my treasure is understanding who I am in Christ, then all of a sudden God empowers that truth by grace to become my life. Because then God goes into the biggest section of worry in the Bible. The biggest section that I've found. Oh, it says, don't worry about this, don't worry about that, don't worry about this, don't worry about that. The birds of the air, they don't worry. They don't store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father provides for them. Check this out. Oh, this is awesome. This knocks the worthlessness out. It says, of how much more value are you than they? So of how much more value are you than the birds? So God says that we're valuable, but we sell out cheap to the devil when he says we're worthless. Because there are seeds trying to reproduce themselves in the soul of man. Depression, anger, bitterness, worthlessness, selfishness, anger, wrath, malice, unforgiveness. These are all seeds from the devil. And he is trying to make your soul think like him while on the earth. And if he can get you to move in gifting and think that way, boy, he can really have his way. Because then he'll see people that walk in gifting but are really, really... Having problems here, so they're walking gifting, but then behind the scenes, there are different persons, which makes them still a hypocrite. He loves hypocrisy because Jesus despised it and rebuked it more than anything when he was on the earth. But we don't have to have hypocrisy. We can have a love relationship with God to where your heart becomes so soft to the silent, still small, to the, to the still small voice of God that when something's wrong and something's out, he whispers to you, hey, this isn't right. That's called relationship. Are we okay? You sure? We okay? Time-wise? Sorry, man. I told you, dude, I'm about ready to explode, man. It really, honestly, I promise, it really is better than you think. God, God thought about this for a long, long time. And he actually thought that his son would be enough. We've made more of our experiences in our situations and our stuff the cost of truth that sets us free. We've made more of our experience than we have the blood of Jesus. And we've allowed our experience and we've lived by feelings instead of walked by faith. And we've been squeezed and pushed by the wrong one. And if the devil ever, 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 listen, it says when they did it to Jesus, if he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't have done it, but he did. It says, if the powers and principalities would have known, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus, but they did. What if the powers and principalities, if they knew what they were doing, they shouldn't have touched you, but they did? Listen. Watch. Listen. It says, if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. So what if hell is in a huge cover-up over what they wish they never did? What if hell realizes that if they can get you blind 
blindsided, smacked enough from left to right that you won't know which way is up. And you'll seek for people to pray for you more than you will for a relationship that you have with God. Because the devil clowns and blind, he, clou- he clouds and he blinds the eyes of those, lest they should see. What if the God of this world, listen man, this is a big deal. I believe when Jesus was crucified, when he was crucified and he was down in hell, I believe it, it the, uh, to me personally, I, I believe that he paid for our sin. I believe that on that third day, I believe the Holy Ghost. I, listen, I don't believe it was a fight. No, nope, I don't at all. See, Satan thought that he won when he crucified Jesus on the tree. He did. He's like, yes. Because all he knows how to do is steal, kill, destroy, steal, kill, destroy. That's all he knows how to do. So he thought that he won. But on that third day, light lit up darkness, man. See, I just believe it with all my heart. I can't even tell you how, how important this is to me. I'm watching people get this, dude. I'm watching people get free from them. This is amazing. You know, this is great because, like, where this is really tested is Wednesday at work. Because there's all people always around you. Always get a chance to work on this one, man. But when someone hits you and someone smacks you with some silly stuff, all of a sudden your response is different. And you'll go home and you'll think about it and be like, oh, my gosh. Something's different. It's the truth of who God says you are. It's so good. I'm watching people get it. Watch. Here's what I believe happened. I believe when Jesus on the third day, the Holy Ghost, comes down with the key. Romans one, or, uh, Revelation 118, the keys to hell, death, and the grave. Yeah? The ones that he told Peter in Matthew 16. In that day, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in wherever you, right? You got it? So those keys, I believe that when Jesus received those keys, that the devil knew that there was big trouble, man. Big trouble. Big. Like the end. Big. Like sealed the deal. He did it. The devil did it. Listen, the devil did it. In his wrath to steal, kill, and destroy, he messed up bad. And he knew that he'd been whooped, finished. Because uh, hell couldn't hold Jesus. The grave couldn't hold him. We sing that song, we shout in victory, yet we live in condemnation. That's not okay. You sing that song with this revelation, with this truth, oh my gosh, you won't be able to stop crying. I'm serious. When the devil tries to condemn you and bring something to you, He will be so exposed by the truth of who you know you are that you won't even review that thing. What would it be like for the devil to bring something to you and you'd be like, oh God, thank you. Instead of, I command you to get behind me, Satan. That never works. Because he never gets behind you. Once you entertain him, he stays in front of you. Because he's already behind you. You've turned the wrong way. I promise. It's true. Did you get it? When you, you don't need to command him to get behind you. He already is. But the more that you don't believe that, the more he gets in front of you because you've turned the wrong way. Yeah? So watch. So hell got lit up by the Holy Ghost. And he says, come on, let's go. These are yours. The devil's, oh, that would be an awesome day. Yeah! Oh. See, if you'd see who you really are, you'd realize that when your identity gets secure, that's how he feels when you're around. But he's not used to that. Because he's used to people living in fear. And having to do things to prove who they are instead of living from what Jesus did. You don't have to do anything to prove who you are. Satan's still in the same business. If you're the son of God, then turns these stones into bread. Do something to prove it. I don't have to prove anything. Why? Why did Jesus say that? Come on, he just came out of the River Jordan. 
goes out there to fast. He's out there fasting 40 days. And the devil comes to him, first temptation. And he says, if you're the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. Do something to prove it. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Why did he say that? Not just because it's in Deuteronomy, but because God spoke to him and said, this is my son that I'm well pleased with. So Satan said, do something to prove it. I don't have to. God told me I'm a son. So God's told you the same thing. Come on, man. Be empowered. Are you getting anything out of this, man? It's just like, it's like this. So Jesus, so hell gets into a huddle. I believe it. When Jesus left, I believe that Satan and his demons got in a huddle. Satan's like, come on, guys, settle down. Come on, let's get in here. Listen, listen, we cannot beat God. We've been beat, but we can deceive man. We can get them self-centered, self-focused, angry. We can touch them from every side. We can take away their stuff. We can actually make them think God's the one that did it. Because they say things like God's in control. So they'll think that anything and everything is God. This is going to be easy. We can't beat God. He beat us. Well, we can deceive man. Come on, God. This is easy. Ready? We're going to break in about three seconds. We're going to go up there and just deceive men, get them self-centered, self-focused, and get their eyes fixed on them. It'll be easy. They're selfish. They're just like us. Ready? Break. Promise, man. He's not up to anything new. It's the same thing. Paul says that we shouldn't be unwise to his tactics. And it comes by being renewed in the spirit of your mind. It comes by being not conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind so that we can know what is and what is God, isn't God's will. God's not in control. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And when I was not a Christian, I thought to myself, if God's in control, he's out of control. I don't want anything to do with that. Because God doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. There's still a thief. And people blame God for a lot of stuff that he never did. God's only good. He only has good stuff to give us. He doesn't have bad stuff to give you. So it's very important to know what is and what isn't God. To know the will of God. Jesus came down. If you want to know the will of God, an easy way to know it is to study the life of Jesus. Because he was the walking will of God. Everything he did and said was exactly God's will every time minus none. Ever. You cannot go wrong with that. That's why it's very important to, to know the life of Jesus and study the word. You guys all right? Okay. Let me, let me get back into Matthew. Isn't it cool? Holy Ghost is my friend. Otherwise, I'd be ADD and it'd be in trouble. <laughs> but he brings me back usually down every hole or later. And then I'm like, <coughs> and I pray for you guys to get it when I'm gone. <laughs> so in Matthew. Are you leaving? Where are you going? <laughs> Where's your music team at? Really? Is this the guy that came in to get you out? Is that what he was doing? Uh, you, were you taking away my peeps? <laughs> Come on, all you guys stand up. Just these group. Don't get in the group if you're not in the group. But there's going to be another group seating up here in just a minute. <laughs> okay, all of you guys get together. Come on. <coughs> so you're all music group. Right? It's amazing. You've got a big music group. What church are you from? Church of Christ? Wow. New Bethel. Awesome. Guys, stretch forth your hands. <coughs> All right. We're going to pray for you, okay? Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Whoa, Jesus. 
We worship you. We say new songs, Jesus, with revelation and truth. May they change the world. Let the Holy Spirit rise. Let the world be overcome by the church of Christ. Amen. Love you guys. Bless you, man. Bless them real good. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, God. We just bless them. In Jesus' name, overwhelm them, God, with your heart. God, I'm asking you to baptize them in the fire of you. In Jesus' name. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come right now. Right now. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Fire of God. In Jesus' name. God, I thank you. Empower them. Come on, Holy Ghost. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. More. 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 Stretch forth your hand, guys. They need this. Jesus, come on. Holy Spirit, come. Fire of heaven. Jesus' name. Fire of heaven. Come. Baptize them in your fire, God. In Jesus' name. Consume them. Consume them. Consume them. Consume them. Jesus, consume them. Baptize them in the fire of your presence, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Holy Ghost. Presence of God, come. Jesus' name. Wreck them real good, God. Jesus' name. It's your presence. Somebody touch that man back there. Oh, let me down there. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Come on, Holy Spirit. Empower them in Jesus' name. The fire of your presence, come. More. More. Jesus' name. More. Oh, you shouldn't have sat up in the front. (laughs) Jesus. Come on, God. Father, I thank you. You have been praying for this for a long time, ma'am. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. More. 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 Fire of your presence, come. More. More. Jesus, come on. God, I'm asking you to overwhelm them to make their drive home hard. In Jesus' name. Let the church get overwhelmed with your goodness, God. In Jesus' name. Come on, God, more. More freedom. Freedom. Fire of heaven. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus. 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 Bless them real good, God. Jesus. Bless them real good. Yeah. Come on, God. God, I thank you that you'd raise them up to be women of purity in Jesus' name. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. Let them raise the bar in purity. Jesus, Jesus, amen, love you, bless you, champion, bless you, bless you man, love you guys, bless you, yeah, love you, are you going to go out the back door, bless them real good on their way out guys. Okay, that was great. <laughs> Love you. Bless you, man. Bless you. Are you a pastor? Huh? You're an elder. Come on. Jesus, I'm asking you to bless him. <laughs> They'll only fight you for a little while, man. 
Raise the bar. People's lives depend on it, man. Jesus' name. Bless you, man. Ah. Okay. Wow. Awesome. You see my bodyguard? <laughs> I am glad he's on my team, man. <laughs> Thank you. Life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> oh, man. I'm watching God cross denominations like you can't even imagine. Can't. Are we okay time-wise still? Are you okay? <laughs> the nods are getting a little less. They're like, <laughs> we got kids. We got kids. I just turn, okay. I'll be done in just a couple minutes. No, I really will. No, I can't. No, I get it. Um, I, I just, a couple months ago, I got invited to go to this, to go to this event. Um, they brought me into Rama, And they let me do the men's Rama conference. Pastor's conference. If you know anything about Rama, it was the most amazing. Kenneth Hagen, like those guys. Dude, it was crazy. I'm telling you this. To, to, to seek Jesus, to seek him, to make sure that, that you are going after the truth of what the gospel says so you won't be deceived by sloppy grace. We can't afford, we can't afford to have this move, swing, and this has nothing to do with Rhema, this has nothing to do, this has to do with, with people that have grown up in the church and having to do with legalism, and it just being nothing but legalistic, we can't afford to have the pendulum swing the whole way from legalism all the way to, to the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit and to sloppy grace. And so what's happening is people are reacting so bad to coming out of religion that they're going right past relationship, going into grace and gifting with no, no truth and saying that the words of Jesus don't matter and the Beatitudes are for them, they're not for now, but they're the attitudes of being for now. The Beatitudes are my attitude that comes from my, my place of being in Christ. That's what the Beatitudes are. It's my attitude of being. It's not my do attitude. It's my be attitude. So it's who God's created me to be. And it's amazing. And there, man, I've camped in the Beatitudes and let that be my life. Man, I want God, make this my life. God, thank you. It says, blessed am I when I'm persecuted for righteousness sake. For great is my reward. God, I am blessed when people despise me. When people say mean things about me. For your name's sake. I am blessed. God, when people are mean to me, I want to bless them back. Because I bless those that despitefully use me. I pray for those that persecute, or I pray for those that despitefully use me, and I bless those that persecute me. Those things can only be established through relationship and intimacy in a place of being. But there is no sloppy grace in that life. There's not, because it, it, that sloppy grace is the same as sin. Because you're like, well, hey, it's just easy, man. Chill, I'm under grace. Back off. We can't afford to say back off that much that the truth isn't the truth. And then we bring in some other false truth that's not the truth at all. It's just a lie. And it's empowered by hell. And the devil wants us to operate in a gifting and have it like a sloppy grace doctrine so that he can just wipe Jesus' face in the miry clay. Come on, man. I'm being real. It's huge stuff. That's why I preach what I preach, because you can be free from all that stuff. You can be free from condemnation, guilt, shame, none of that stuff. All that stuff can be free. So let me go into Matthew 6, let me, and let me finish this out, and then we're going to pray. Okay? All right? You guys good? <sighs> so, so it says, consider the birds of the air. They neither reap nor store away in barns. They don't do this. Are you 41, 46? 
Are you 4146? Okay, someone's 4146. Don't reap or store away in barns that, you know, consider, you know, it says the birds, they don't do that. Yet you're more valuable. You have more value than they, right? And then it says, you know, the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. And it says that they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. So watch. So it says, after all these things, the pagans seek. And listen very carefully to this. This is huge. It says, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. But in the King James, it says pagans. And he's referring to people that are not, are, were not Jews. He was referring to people that, that, weren't, that weren't believers in God. So he says, after all these things, the pagans seek. And then it says this. It says, for your heavenly Father knows the things that you need. To me, when I, when I read that, to me it hit my heart in such a way that God already knows what I need so I don't have to ask him for it. This, this is huge. Now, this is what I live by. This is something that has kept me free from that thing. And I've always known that God's, God, he, dude, my, he's got the cattle of a thousand hills. I mean, you know, God's got everything. So, so I've never, oh, it's going to sound weird, but I, I live by it. I've never, I've never gone to a table and, and got a waiter and blessed my waiter because I'm hoping to get back something from God. I've only Given because love gives, and that's what love does. Does that make sense? So I've never given like a, a, a tip. I've never paid somebody's mortgage because I want God to pay mine. Because that can be given in selfishness. I give because that's what love does. Love just gives. So radically generous. Well, I'm, I'm radically generous. And, and I, I see that scripture in Matthew 6, and it says, After all these things the pagans seek, which means that they built their life on stuff, receiving stuff, not having stuff, and all of a sudden, when you pray for stuff and stuff doesn't come, we blame God like he didn't give you. But we don't have to remind God of the things we need because he knows what we already need. Does that make sense? This will save you a lot of heartache and a lot of worry because worry comes with the lack. So any place that we're in a place of lack, we're, we're not in a good place. And it's actually worrying, and worrying is the active art of paganism. That's not mean, that's scriptural. You'll see it. It's in Matthew 6. It says, but seek it first. Okay. So this is the scripture that I wanted to get to. All that, just to get to this. There's a lot of truth in all of it. So in Matthew 6, 33, I, I went, gosh. When I went to Teen Challenge, and I was there for two months, I had a radical encounter with Jesus, and he told me, Todd, I am stamping a scripture on your forehead, and you're going to live by this scripture all the days of your life. And he said, it's Matthew 6, 33. And I'm like, all right, what is it? I don't even know, you know? I don't even know what it is. So I'm like, I read it, and I'm like, okay. Awesome. I have no idea what it is. So I realized that the whole Old Testament is set up on this word called righteousness. And the only way for us to get it in the Old Testament was for us to walk out 613 laws and 10 commandments perfectly and never miss it. So the law was set up into a place where it said, like in Deuteronomy 28, it gives you the blessings of obedience. And the blessings of obedience are what would come upon you if you fulfill the law. And if you fulfill the law, then righteousness would be fulfilled and you'd be right with God through your own works. Are you with me? So there's 613 laws and 10 commandments. And if I fulfilled all of them to the T and never missed one, because the law says that if I transgress one, they're all awash. Are you with me? So if I fulfilled 612 laws but fell short on one, I failed 613 and 10 commandments. All of them were awash. So their life was filled with condemnation because even though they wanted to do the things they, they knew to do, they didn't. And even though they willed to do those things, they... And so they Romans 7 through their life. And their life under the law was even though you know what to do, you don't do it. And you do the things that you don't know what, that you shouldn't do. You know, it's that twisted life. But Paul wasn't talking about living in Christ because Romans 8 is living under the Spirit. Romans 7 is living under the law. Romans 6 is being buried and crucified. So it's talking about the law and he's talking about there's no way for you to fulfill it because even though you want to, you can't. 
So Jesus paid this price. Now watch this. In order for me to get right standing with God, I have to walk out 613 laws and 10 commandments. And if I miss one, even if I'm 30 years into my life, all of a sudden, I've missed them all. So my whole life is awash. So then condemnation comes because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus pays this price. So watch this. Picture this. This is amazing. See, John the Baptist is this wild man that's out there in a river baptizing people. I believe he looked a little like me. <laughs> uh, he might have had dreads. Come on. Did you see the Bible series? He had them. So seriously, watch this. So John the Baptist is baptizing people in the River Jordan. This is something that I started out with my Christian life on when God told me to seek it. This is what opened to me. So you asked me yesterday about like how this thing, this is it. So, so John the Baptist is baptizing people unto repentance. Jesus comes down to the River Jordan at 30 years of age. 30 because in Jewish culture you inherit everything that your father has when you turn 30. So when Jesus was about to call God his father, everything that his father had was legally his. So that's why they wanted to kill him. One of the reasons. Okay, so Jesus comes down to the river. John the Baptist looks at Jesus and he goes, oh. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Whoa. Jesus is like, I need you to baptize me. Jesus didn't have any sin. He was sinless. Watch this, man. This is like amazing. John the Baptist looks at Jesus, guaranteed he went mm. why? because when this happened everything that John's life was born for was finished John was on the earth to bear witness and to make a straight path for the Lord to travel and now the Lord had traveled and John was about to do something to make history. John was groomed, and even in Elizabeth's womb, he tumbled when Jesus came on the scene, fetus wise. John was prepared, even in the womb, for this right here. And God knows the thoughts and plans he has for you, and he knit you in your mother's womb. This is all so good. So, so, so John's born, and his whole life is groomed. For one reason only, to make a straight path for Jesus. So John's baptizing people, and everything comes before him. And he looks, and he goes, oh, he's the one. And Jesus is like, I need you to baptize me. John's like, oh, no, dude. <laughs> I need your baptism. But John couldn't get Jesus' baptism, because that one could only be given once Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Right? So Jesus said, no, John, listen. It is necessary. And this is so crucial to your foundation in your life. This is necessary so that righteousness might be fulfilled. So what happened? When righteousness got fulfilled, that means that somebody walked out the law and never missed it. The Ten Commandments and never missed it. So at 30, Jesus had fulfilled the law. All Ten Commandments comes to John. Ask John to baptize him so that righteousness gets fulfilled. What does that mean? That means it is the fulfillment of righteousness. So it says that when Jesus got baptized, the heavens were opened. And in Deuteronomy 28, in the blessings of obedience, it says, I will open the heavens and cause it to rain. The, Deuteron the blessings of Deuteronomy, you see it. It's Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So it's the blessings of obedience, but you don't have to live in the blessings of your obedience. You live in the blessings of his obedience. So Jesus paid the price, and it says that the heavens were opened for him, not for us, for him. So God says, this is my son, and him I'm well pleased. So Jesus goes out, does what he does, and, and the 40 days of temptation, and then he lives his life for three and a half years, filling the will of God to its fullest extent, ever seen, ever made possible before. So Jesus is, or ever, ever possible before. He is going through, and it is like one man walking in right standing with God. One man that's secure in his identity with his father. 
One man that says, I and the Father are one. One man that is not modeling Jesus, he's modeling Christianity. He's modeling Christianity. So he lives and he walks and everything that he does, he does completely yielded to God, completely filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus never does anything unless the Father does it. Never says anything unless the Father says it. But Jesus wasn't a robot. He was relationship walking. Come on. So Romans 8.11 says that the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same one. So Jesus goes and he lives his life. And for three and a half years, the disciples are, it's crazy nuts, man. Ah! It's no wonder when he said, I'm going to die. There were Peter's like, no way! Right? It's no wonder. He's the best thing that ever happened. Judas sold him out because he wanted to throw the Roman government out. So Judas sells out Jesus because he wants the Roman government to be done. He figures he's going to force the hand. But Jesus didn't come to, for that kind of government. He came with the government of the kingdom that governs from within. But we couldn't have it until he was crucified. So Jesus pays this price. And on the tree, he finishes Everything, he says, his last words are, it is finished. So your way to get to God through your works is finished. So Jesus hangs there on the tree, and it says that he who knew no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He didn't know any sin. He never sinned. He became it so that you could become something. And we say, well, Jesus was marred beyond any man. He was ripped to shreds. It says that he didn't even look like Jesus. You couldn't even recognize him on that tree. Why did Jesus have to get ripped apart so much? Why was he so shredded on the tree? Why? Because we didn't look like anything we were created to be any longer. So Jesus had to become something that we were never created to be so that we could finally become something that we were always predestined and created to be from the beginning. So when you become the righteousness of God and you have your right standing with the king and you look in the mirror and you see that, all of a sudden everything's different, man. Everything's different. So Jesus pays this price, goes to hell, and on that third day, woo, come on, let's roll. Jesus comes up and listen to this, crazy, because Mary, she's the first one at the tomb, right? She gets there, the, the stones roll away. Oh no, they took him. She runs back to the house. She gets Peter and John. They took the Lord's body. They're like, no way, because all of them saw on the tree what Jesus looked like. He didn't look like anything. He was ripped apart. What they saw on that tree overwhelmed what Jesus said was going to happen. Because he said on the third day, and none of them were waiting at that tomb for him to come out. Because what they saw overwhelmed what he said. And we can't afford to let life overwhelm what God said. So John and Peter run to the tomb. Peter is slacking. John's there first. John gets there. He won't go in. But Peter's like, I'm in, dude. He runs in there and he sees that he's gone. And like, oh my God. They walk away. And all of a sudden Mary's there. She's hanging, crying. And she turns around. She thinks it's a gardener. Right? Where did you put him? Where did you put my Lord? And he says, Mary. She knows that voice, man. It's the voice of truth itself. Mary. (gasps) Rabboni. Master. She goes to hold him. And Jesus says, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. In other words, I have something that I have for you. But go and tell the disciples that I'm ascending to my Father. To my God and your God. That day God became our Father. What does that mean? That means that my identity doesn't come from my natural father and mother. Listen, I've got brand new DNA that comes from my heavenly father. I've got the divine nature of Abba. (laughs) DNA. So I've got a brand new dad. So watch. What that does is no matter what my parents did, 
no matter what my mom did, no matter if she rejected me when I was a fetus, no matter what, it doesn't matter. Jesus said yes. When I see that, everything changes. <gasps> oh my gosh, he wanted me. He, he likes to live in me. He, he's head over heels with me. I'm not kidding. Dude, right now he's hugging me. He loves me. He's overwhelmed with my existence because I believe that he's my father. And no natural circumstance, no natural life experience can separate me from the loving God that cared so much for me, that he gave everything for me. Nobody can take that from me. Not my wife, not my kids, not my mother, not my father. Because when Jesus went to heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, it cries out, mercy, mercy forever. It's always mercy, always mercy. The blood of Jesus speaks better things. Mercy, mercy, mercy. So now my mother and my dad, because my mom, she put me in a boy's home when I was a little kid. She put me in a place called the Masonic Homes. The Masons raised me. And watch this. When I tell people that, they make a bigger deal over that than they do the blood of Jesus that set me free from all that. That's a problem. Let me ask you this. Oh, this is a great can of worms. <laughs> what generational curse or Masonic curse is bigger and stronger than the blood of Jesus? Then why wouldn't I just believe in the blood of Jesus? Come on, which, which is more powerful? My, my great-great-grandfather's sinful deed that's carried into my generation or me seeing righteousness that will carry to a thousand? I'm going with that one. Does that make sense? So right standing with God is everything. If you see who God's created you to be, your life will never be the same. And people around you will get wrecked by your very existence. Amen? Look, I'm just going to ask this and then we're going to pray. Is there anybody here that's never known Jesus? That you've just never, you came here, people brought you here, but you've never like given your life to God. I would really love to pray with you. Come on, man. Don't be a chicken. Come on. There's more people. I need you guys. Just stand. Hey, do me a favor. Back up a little bit, guys. Just stand right here. Right here. That's good. Just stand down there for me. Look, who, who else is here that's never given their life to Jesus? Listen, come on. Come up here. Don't be afraid. Please, this be the best thing you ever did, ever. Lord Jesus, I need everybody to pray with me. Lord Jesus. Look, if you're not praying, I'll just think that you're out there and you didn't get saved. And you need to right now. Okay, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus we, believe we believe that you died for our sin, died for our sin. and that you raised from the dead for us. You were crucified for our offenses, and all of our sin was laid upon you on the tree. And then when you rose from the grave, you, from the grave, you, paid, a price you paid a price to fill me with your Holy Spirit. So right now, God, right now, God I, am my life to you, I am giving my life to you, saying the big yes. Saying the big yes. I'm saying yes, yes. I'm saying yes to you. I'm saying yes to you. Nothing will hold me back from you any longer. You are my yes. You are my yes. I am your amen. I am your amen. You are my yes, Jesus. I am your amen on this earth. You are my yes, Jesus. And I am your amen on this earth. Use me as a conduit for your glory, 
for your miracles, for your prophecy, for your wisdom. Let me be a knower of your truth. Let me be a spirit-filled, fiery Christian that burns bright for the whole world to see. Let me be a conduit of a burning flame everywhere I go, on my job, in the supermarkets, in the hotels, on the streets, in the drugstores, everywhere I go. Let Christ in me flow through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to pray for the sick and all that and then get out of here at dinner. <laughs> Sorry. Check. Yeah, here we go. Chicka chicka woo. Oh, sorry. Thought we were gonna go for. Did you do it? You rap? I can. Yeah. Do it. Ready? Hold on. Check. Check. Turn the bass up in this one. Check. Here we go. I need as much bass as I can have in this mic right here. This mic, I need a microphone check and a bass. Really? Oh, yeah, sure, we'll go with it. Okay, a little bit louder on my mic. Okay, ready? <laughs> Cool J O run DMC and the Beastie Boys have got nothing on me. Cause I don't rap junk and I don't rap math. I'm rapping for the king, his name is J E S U S. People say that Christians shouldn't get into rap. They tell me what am I doing? Am I taking a nap? I wanna make one thing totally understood. I'm gonna claim to that. That which is good if you want the very best for my life. Sit and listen as I rap about Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. We came up with a website, it's called Lifestyle Christianity. We have our newsletter that's gonna go out, you can sign up for our email list. We also have testimonies on there, event schedule, all that stuff. It'll be amazing, we wanna empower our generation to walk Christianity as a lifestyle. So we can all walk with the power of God on a constant basis. It's gonna be awesome, so come on over. Bless you, thanks for watching.